So um, this session is about the true price of coffee and what makes coffee, um, what, how that concept of true pricing could help to make coffee a future-proof product. Uh, in other words, how can we make sure that coffee is still there um, in, in, in one or two generations instead of, um, 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 uh, instead of being depleted uh, to a level where we are no longer able to uh, enjoy our cup of coffee. Um, my name is Meine van der Graaf. I work for MVO Nederland. <clears throat> they call me an expert on sustainable coffee, I see here. Well, that's great. Um, I'm a business developer and uh, work closely with Floor on the project of uh, true cost accounting and true pricing for coffee in a network of companies, of, about which I will uh, tell more uh, in a moment. Um, Floor? Floor is your, yours? Yes, you had a good word. Floor is yours, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, my name is Floor, Floor van Elze. I work for um, Impact Institute and TruePrice. So TruePrice has been around already for, um, well, almost a decade actually, but uh, in this current shape, I think around uh, eight or nine years. Um, I've worked there for three years and since last year or the year before, we've also started Impact Institute, which is a related company. Um, and the main difference is that with true price, we really work on a product level. So what is the true price, the actual costs of a product when you take into account all the environmental and social um, costs as well. And for Impact Institute, we more, work usually more on a company level. So what is all the value creation that happens within a company and how can we um, help companies to steer on increasing that long-term value? Um, I am an expert on Nothing, it says on this slide, or maybe on everything. Oh, oh wow, oh, right, that's good. <laughs> that's nice. Okay, expert on everything. Yeah, let's, let's <laughs> just keep it at that. Um, now, my main, uh, the main things that I work on at uh, Impact Institute and True Price is kind of two ways. On the one hand, I work a lot on projects like this one, so on coffee, but also, for instance, on cocoa or on mangoes or on other uh, kinds of products. Bread, for instance, from the Netherlands as well is one product that we've looked at. Um, and on the other hand, I also work a lot on more um, the energy sector. So that's quite different, um, but equally interesting, in my opinion, on uh, what the external costs are of the energy that we get and how um, different companies can work together to uh, make their impact on society better. Yeah. Great. Elena, you're next on my list. Could you give a short introduction? Yes, sure. Hello, everybody. My name is Elena. Uh, I'm currently working as a uh, communications consultant for the GIZ um, in the field of uh, innovation fund, which is basically uh, an innovation competition for GIZ staff um, in order to contribute innovative ideas and enhance the effectivity of the project. And I currently came across the idea of fair chain coffee, so I thought it might be interesting to hear a bit more about the field. All right, great, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Ivy? Yes, I to unmute myself. Hi, uh, my name is Ivy de Bruin. Uh, I work for SDG Nederland. Um, so we promote the SDGs uh, here in the Netherlands. Um, we are a network organization uh, with over thousands of organizations uh, in our community. Um, funny is that tomorrow I'll be hosting uh, uh, an interactive workshop here at Impact Fest, also uh, on true pricing, uh, then not aimed at specifically coffee, but more, uh, yeah, the, uh, the overall picture of uh, true pricing. Uh, because we think that, um, well, one of the ways in which we can achieve the SDGs is to, uh, uh, yeah, to work with true prices and to make uh, people more aware of what this is and why we should pay the true price of products. So, um, yeah, good to be here and uh, thanks. Great to have you. Thanks. Uh, Julia. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, I already know you, uh, Mina. Yeah, um, correct. But, um, I'm currently an intern at um, Blanchdal. It's a coffee roastery in the south of the Netherlands. And um, we are also collaborating with MVO Nederlands on the True Cost Accounting Project currently. Um, and I'm working on the so uh, sustainability part of, uh, of Blanchdown. So that's why I'm here to learn more uh, about the True Cost Accounting. Good that you're here. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Margit. 
Hi, I'm Margit Ferber. I'm Business Development Director for Fairtrade in the Netherlands. Well, uh, Fairtrade, uh, Fairtrade's mission is to establish a sustainable livelihoods for farmers and workers. And our core objectives are to establish living incomes uh, for farmers and living wages for workers. So from that perspective, we're very enthusiastic um, about uh, the Future Proof Coffee Collective. Uh, we've developed in the recent years a holistic living income strategy uh, first in cocoa in, and now in coffee um, with concrete parameters. Uh, and it would be very nice uh, to fit that in with this uh, TCA tool. Well, we've been we've been uh, we've been a bit busy, so um, I can already say that uh, in 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 some ways it's already <clears throat> quite well integrated. So we're working together with um, with your colleague in in Germany, Carla, and uh, and in a number of ways the approach of uh, of fair trade is already uh, fairly well aligned with uh, with what we do in the in the TCA tooling and uh, what uh, True Price does. So uh, I think we're taking good steps there. And um, maybe we can uh, can have some uh, some talk about that a little bit more later on in the, in the discussion. Thank you. Great, thank you, Saskia. Hi everyone. Um, my name is Saskia. Mena, can I kind of recognize your face? I used to work at Bop Inc. in the same. Oh company. yeah, yeah, probably. Um, I've, I'm sort of the interior for for MVN Netherlands after ten years, so probably. Oh, you're... there you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so now I work at Imagine Foundation, um, where I'm a research and insights associate. What we do currently is we're working with a collective of CEOs in the food industry of uh, multinational CEOs uh, on shifting the industry towards more sustainable practices. Uh, part of that is um, uh, the true pricing of food. So I'm curious yeah. to learn more here. Yeah. Great. Okay, good. Well, perfect that you're here then. Um, and then probably there's already also a good uh, a good option tomorrow if you want to uh, take a deep dive uh, in the subject to uh, to join the session of EV. Um, all right. Well, let's kick off. I think and someone uh, else uh, joined. Oh, yeah. So someone... Thank you for your sharp view, Eliana. Let's promote Eliana to panelist as well. Did that work? Yeah. Hi, Eliana, can you, yes. hi, can, you, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. You were just in time for our introduction round. Yes, I saw. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm yeah. Uh, joining this session out of interest. I'm working on multiple initiatives. One of the initiatives I've been working on is to um, uh, set up an organization called the Groente and Fruitbrigade. It's uh -huh. an organization that collects fruits and vegetables, leftover fruits and vegetables uh, for the Dutch food banks. Great. Interesting. Could be a whole webinar on itself. <laughs> yeah. all Maybe. Right. Maybe. Okay. Thank you very much for for all your uh, introductions, and um, let's kick off then. Um, so the program for today is to very shortly uh, introduce MVO Nederland and the Future Proof Coffee Collective, and uh, and to explain a little bit how we think we are nudging the system of uh, in in this case specifically the coffee sector to uh, to become more sustainable. In other words, more future proof. And in the second part, uh, Floor will um, give some uh, some insights on how True Price is playing a key role in that. And then at the end, we hope to have uh, some 10 minutes left to uh, to do some Q and A and some uh, maybe get some insights as well from from the from the attendance from the uh, from the session. So I'll be kicking off. Um, so MVN Nederland is a network organization. We have about around about 2,000 paying partners. Uh, most of them are small and medium-sized companies. Some of them are bigger companies as well. And in, in the last case, then uh, you see that most of the time the CSR manager is the contact person and is involved in the in the programs that we uh, that we offer. Um, I myself work for the international department and focus mainly on international value chains. Um, to support Dutch SME companies to make their value chain more sustainable or to bring their sustainable solution to international markets. In the case of coffee, it's very obvious that, um, that there is enough um, of that going on. So there's a lot of small and medium sized companies on one hand. On the other side, you have really, really big companies that um, really dominate the market. So there was a lot of potential, in our opinion, to work together with small and medium sized coffee companies to make a difference in their value chain, bringing them together to form, so to say, a, um, a counter um, sound to 
to these big parties in the market. Other um, um, sectors that we work uh, with are tourism, concrete, care. Um, uh, we also have front runners, sort of a network specifically on people that consider themselves or we consider them the front runners. So we bring them together cross sectoral, um, but we also work in leather and in ICT internationally. Um, so we have uh, quite we have quite a wide range of, uh, of subjects that we try to uh, um, to contribute uh, to to a more sustainable future. Um, in this case, we're talking about the Future Proof Coffee Collective. Um, this is a group of um, about between twenty five and thirty companies that have joined hands and have decided that together they can do more than separately. Most of them already are quite front running on their own. Um, but they all have come to the conclusion that on their own, it will be difficult to really make a, um, a, make a, um, a change in the sector. So uh, we were exactly on the right time, I think, to bring them together. And together we found that the, the price of coffee itself was one of the main barriers to change the sector. And through that, uh, we came to the conclusion that true pricing or true cost accounting was one of the ways, one of the... Um, instruments that we should um, embrace and find ways to uh, to implement that in practice. Um, we made a short video at the start of our, our project one and a half years ago to explain a bit about what we do. So I hope the sound works. If not, please indicate and then we will move on and you can I will send you the link so you can look it up online. The sound works, but... <laughs> Let's see if that's, there it goes. I think the sound is not audible for us. It's not audible? No. I think if well, you, when you share your screen, you have to check a box saying share computer sound. Okay. Well, let's see. There is a um, um, subtitle, so I think I'm gonna keep it running and you just uh, read along and, uh, and I will share the, the link. Um, later, so you can look it up on uh, on YouTube. Let's go. All right. Well, I have a ring in my ear, but um, the rest of you uh, were not able to hear it. Sorry for that. Well, and I will send you a link in the in the chat at the end of the session, so you can uh, 
can look up the, um, the animation. All right. Um, <clears throat> so for now, these are uh, some of the companies that are involved in, in the Future Proof Coffee Collective. If you are familiar in the coffee sector, you will see that uh, most of them are, are really small or relatively small companies. Some of them are better known. Others are really local um, and locally active. Um, we have roasters, traders, um, um, Horika outlets, and, uh, um, and brands such as Fairtrade Original in there, but also you see um, True Price and uh, Soil and More and, and parts of the Dutch government as partners of our uh, initiative, because in our opinion, it's all about public-private uh, cooperation in order to make this, um, the problems in the, in the sector a part of the, uh, the past. Um, so the biggest challenges in the market for, for coffee are the price crisis, I think is uh, uh, on, a, on a lonely uh, high place one. Um, climate change is, is then a problem that there is not enough uh, insight and not enough uh, um, room for investment uh, to tackle. And another big problem is that market concentration is, um, is ongoing. So you see that bigger companies are taking over larger parts of the, of, of the coffee sector. Um, which makes it more difficult for small companies to um, to show their um, sh show their value in the market. Um, there's a first mover dilemma that we see that um, companies are afraid to uh, change their business model. So who's going to start off with paying the right price for coffee? If your if your uh, competition or your colleagues are not doing that, then there's a uh, there will be a problem there. Um, so it would be good if you do it uh, uh, together in a bit of a coordinated way, and then you will see that there's competition law that will uh, get, could get in your way. Um, so Ambionet is having a really close um, contact with uh, the, um, uh, the parts of the Dutch government that are um, um, uh, responsible for that uh, in order to make sure that we do not cross any lines when it comes to competition law. Um, as I already said, this coffee price is the main issue because of which the companies came together. All of them said to us when we did our first explorations, they really, really want to change. And some of them already have their ways to make their customers understand that there's another price tag to coffee, but all of them uh, explain, explained to us that it would be beneficial if there would be a model, a framework uh, for them as smaller and medium-sized companies to explain to their customers why coffee has a different price tag in order for them to bring that money to the farms where the difference can be made. For now, the only uh, option there is, is to use certified coffee. And that is, um, I would say for now, in a lot of cases, the best solution available, uh, but especially for these smaller size companies, also working with smaller estates in producing company, countries, um, um, only certified coffee doesn't really uh, cover the need. It's in a lot of cases expensive for them to uh, to get certified and costs a lot of effort and uh, doesn't provide them with the option to um, to make themselves uh, um, stick out from their competition. Um, big problem in coffee country is that um, because of the low prices, the only business model that really works is this one. Um, and that's painful because uh, if you look at this, you see uh, it looks it looks neat, and um, but if you look closely, everybody will understand that such a monoculture. And if you look at the soil in between, there's nothing growing except for the coffee, and it's mechanically um, um, processed. And for that reason, in this case, Brazil is able to really have low prices for the coffee, and in that way, uh, more or less, uh, host, uh, um, keeping the rest of the coffee sector hostage uh, and, and forcing these prices as low as they are. And we think that. In order to show that there's another model, you need to have a different price tag so that you can change uh, your way of farming to a more um, robust agroforestry model, for instance, such as this one, where you see that it's still more or less monoculture on, on a coffee level, but there's a lot of shade trees. And in a lot of cases, these farmers on more steep hills work with, um, um, uh, with different crops as well for their income. Uh, but in order to make that shift, the business model for coffee really, really needs to uh, to change. And in our opinion, this guy and his colleagues are needed for that. So um, as many coffee uh, roasters, as many people in the coffee sector need to really um, um, uh, tell this story. Uh, and that's why we bring them together. 
Uh, these are a couple of examples of uh, um, research that has been done in the past by uh, colleague organizations and uh, fair, uh, fair trade and also true price on, on specifically income of farmers, but also related to, uh, to, uh, to environmental elements. Um, and one of the claim, uh, one of the pitches that we made to the companies is you can you can have such a um, research done, but then you will have a static um, static um, um, document. And in our opinion, it was interesting to find out to what extent do Dutch companies, together with their local partners, to what extent do they want and need a uh, methodology or a tool that they can use ongoing. Um, so that was the start of, of the True Cost Accounting uh, work group where um, uh, very early on True Price, Soilamore and EUI work together to, to make an Excel-based tool uh, that can be used by farmers as well as by, their, um, uh, by the cooperatives or uh, technicians in, in producing countries to calculate the true cost of a number of uh, elements. So it's not complete. If True Price does a research, it's far more uh, complete than, than what the tool has to offer for now, but that is what we... Um, uh, what we had to do, what to, what we had to work with for now. Um, so we're working on soil quality, um, water use, carbon emission, um, biodiversity loss, and living income. And along the way, we hope to add more um, um, elements to that. Um, so very shortly, but Flora will get into that uh, 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 more in more detail. Uh, if you calculate the true price, you see that these costs, the social costs and the environmental costs that are now not paid, if you look at the light gray area, that is the market price. And then you see that a lot of the uh, external costs are just not included in that price. If you were able to uh, create a higher price in the second uh, graph, then with that higher price, you could invest in bringing down those externalities and you would see that in the end probably some of the externalities will not be included in the price but you can you you are able in that way to minim, minimize those um those external costs and that is our um that is our aim um and this is what that looks like if a company uses our tooling for now this is an excel based tool we're working on a more fancy uh var variation but for now this is what we have um, this provides a, a farmer and his um, value chain partners with insights on all the subjects that I just mentioned, and it shows in the graphs how do the, in the blue um, in the blue graph how do the costs of a farmer how do they relate to the benchmark costs, for instance, for in this case Colombian coffee. So it give, gives the farmer an insight on how he's doing compared to uh, to the benchmark. It also provides the farmer with insights on where are his hotspots. Um, so, for instance, if uh, soil quality would be really high, that would mean that his soil is either, is very uh, much degraded and he's not able to uh, bring that into his price. So it provides him also with management information that he can use uh, in order to decide where he's going to put his investments in the future. And at the same time, it gives him the opportunity to, uh, uh, to get into a conversation with his customers on why a different price tag is in order. Um, an example of a uh, of a case that we're working on. We're working on a number of cases in Colombia and Peru, and starting off in Uganda. Um, and one is Fair Trade Original, working with La Rete Cochera <clears throat> and Soil and More <clears throat> on their community coffee, and they're using the TCA tooling um, <clears throat> to create insights in the quality of the soil and the impact of crop diversification. So if you use cocoa and if you use other crops in in between the coffee, how does that benefit? your farming system, your carbon emission, your soil quality, your water use, et cetera, et cetera. In that, in that sense, they're using the TCA tool as a, um, as a impact measurement tooling, which is very basic. And in the end, you would need additional tooling as well, but it provides insights. And with the results, you can compare it with the other cases that we are working on. So within the network, we aim to create a situation in which all these companies can compare the results of their measurements between one another um, and in that way learn also from each other's uh, interventions and activities. Um, we're now working in uh, Colombia and Peru and starting off in Uganda. But as you see here, this is the bean belt. And we believe that this approach needs to be um, rolled out in at least the top 10 uh, coffee producing countries in order also for bigger companies to use this methodology for their blends, because in a blend, there's, no, uh, there's always more than one uh, coffee. And in 
most cases that's coffee from different countries. So in order to, to get insights, we need to move to a situation in which we can uh, provide that. Um, let's see, now I tried this out, but it's not working the way I hoped, but floor, the floor is yours again to explain to the to the crowd a little bit more about how true pricing fits into what we uh, what we try to accomplish yeah thank you uh Mina. so uh on this first slide um on the background you see uh the um the store actually that is the bottom of our um office in amsterdam on the Haarlemmer plain and this is during the launch of the true price store. And if you look really closely, just below, we start to pay the true price. There's Mina's head, which it's I think is a nice yeah. Yeah. <laughs> detail to start with. Maybe a good energizer, this worst Waldo kind of uh, <laughs> situation. Um, yeah, but maybe if we get into it on the next page, there's also a, a picture of the office, but a bit bigger. Um, so what we aim to do with both true price and impact institutes, as I already shortly uh, introduced earlier is that we want to move towards an impact economy and we say that an impact economy is an economy where all products have a true price and all companies publish an impact statement so that means that all companies take responsibility for the value they create but also the value they distract and um, the, that all products are produced sustainably uh, meaning that a true price is paid for all products um, there is a selection of the people that we've worked with for this on this slide and on the bottom left you see the things that we do generally to promote this impact economy and it's quite varied actually but what might be interesting to mention is that um, I think last month we've launched our training program more widely so uh, there's all these standardized um, programs now available on our website where you can see that um, we have people training other people to do the impact measurements and calculations that we generally do in your own companies um, because we see that to get to this impact economy we need to make more skill so on the one hand we do that by making the tools like uh, what Mina just mentioned to first these excel tools stuff like this but then also to work more towards um, web-based software where companies can keep measuring their own results and start implementing uh, based on that information. And then uh, we also, uh, part of that strategy is also to offer more training so that people can start using the methodologies that we've developed uh, in their own companies. Um, yeah, so the true price, this is similar to the image that mine showed earlier, and there's a really long list of social costs here on the right. So these are all the different elements that we generally take into account as externalities. Although we do always make a scoping decision step in the beginning to see which ones are most relevant for a certain uh, product or a certain value chain. And what you see on the right with the long list of uh, social costs generally around the first half is um, the ones that are always included and more towards the end are different, uh, um, different elements that we include when they are very um, material for a specific case or for a specific products. Um, and here you also see the ones that um, uh, Maina just mentioned. So uh, soil quality, for instance, but also contribution to climate change and water use um, and biodiversity and on the social costs. Uh, that's the insufficient income that we mainly uh, mainly focus on. Um, and how we calculate the true price, it's quite interesting that currently we've also we're also working in a public-private partnership with, amongst others, uh, the Dutch government, Wageningen University, Rabobank, I mean Ambro, Ecocur, and LTO um, to really um, determine what is the best way to calculate a true price because we have an opinion on that. But as I said, if we want to scale up, we need to make sure that everyone um, works, like agrees on the same way of doing that. So harmonizing the method is really something that we've been working on a lot over the past few years. And what you see here is the kind of an, an uh, sort of high level view of how we say that's a true price gap. So the costs, uh, the true costs of a certain impact should be calculated. So what um, we see is that generally, and this is partially also based on uh, guidelines by the OECD, um, 
as well as the um, uh, international conventions for human rights and for environmental um, conventions, we first look at compensating damages. So anything that you can compensate, that you can restore, that you can repair, that's the cost that we look at. And then for anything that you cannot restore, we look for compensation costs. So you can imagine when it comes to, um, for instance, um, child labor, or unpaid labor, there's a part that you can do by restoring that, but you cannot get the child labor out of someone completely. It's very difficult to really just repair. That's what happened to someone. Um, so then we look at compensation for unrepairable damage, and together that sums up into the cost of the damages, so the compensation for the damages. The second part that we look at is to prevent future damages. So we look at what does it cost to uh, monitor and to audit um, for making sure that something doesn't happen again, and also to finance improvements. So to put the situation in place so that you can actually say that it's possible to then not have those future damages in the future. Um, and the third element is the legal part of it. So there's a fine for the damage to the rights that were uh, violated, so to say. And the type of rights that we then look at, so I just briefly touched upon that already, is we say that we're, to make it kind of um, um, easily understandable for everyone, we work with the things that we've already agreed upon as an international community. So on the one hand, that's the International Convention for Human Rights, and on the other hand, that's international climate and environmental agreements. Um, so we basically look at what happens currently and what would be a situation that would be in line with these international agreements that we've all put our signatures on. Um, and then we look at what the difference is between those situations. So that's um, very shortly the, the method as we do that. If you want to know more about this, uh, we have a bunch of publications that set this out because we're working on making our methodology more um, open access. So these are all to be found on our website. So that's trueprice.org. Um, the left one, Principles for True Pricing, shows the uh, kind of the underlying um, ideas that we have for true pricing. So this is the fact that it's based on human rights, for instance, that we have a rights-based approach and that we look at violation of rights. Um, the middle one shows a number of monetization factors for true pricing. So when we look at the footprint of a certain impact, um, you can know, for instance, the amount of CO2 that's been uh, emitted, or you know, for instance, the amount of um, unpaid labor that's gone into a kilogram of coffee, so to say. Um, but how do you then express that in money? So to make sure that it's actually comparable and that you can add it onto the market price. So how we do that is explained in this document, and it also includes um, uh, global monetization factors that we um, that we use. We also have more specific ones for different regions, and those are updated, um, uh, I think, annually, generally. Um, but this document is interesting to look into if you uh, want to know more about that. And then the third um, document, a roadmap for true pricing, is more of a vision paper. So it shows how do we see true pricing helping us to reach that impact economy that I uh, started this presentation with. Um, and if we go to the next slide, I'm afraid now we might be opening the roadmap. Yeah, it was very interactive <laughs> PowerPoint. Yes, perfect. Um, so just to give a quick overview of a bunch of the studies that we've done previously, um, this is just a, a part of the publications that we've done. Um, but if you're interested in learning more about the methodology that we use and the type of information that comes out of that, this would be a good starting point. So this is also all accessible on our website. Um, and what you see is that there's quite a variety of products that we've looked at. So we started for instance, uh, we've worked with Divos for a really long time on the true price of roses. Um, and then it goes all the way up to the true price of jeans. For instance, for Ayman Ambro, the true price of diamonds, which is also a very um, different type of value chain. Um, and you see coffee coming back on a number of occasions. So uh, for instance, with IDH, that was uh, coffee from Vietnam. 
we've looked at coffee from Mexico together with Solidaridad and also coffee from Colombia quite recently. Um, and actually in between there's multiple other times that we've looked at different coffees from different areas. And one thing that might be interesting to mention currently because of uh, uh, the Corona measures, the true price store that you saw on the first slide is not open, but hopefully we will be able to open it at um, some point in the future again. And if you go there, you can actually uh, purchase a cup of coffee uh, for a true price where um, the cost of climate and the cost for uh, living income are then also being compensated. So we actually make sure that the money that's the extra money that's being paid for climate change goes towards um, uh, regenerative landscape. So to actually capture carbon out of the air um, through planting uh, new landscapes and then uh, the costs for underpayments actually go to the world's poorest at this moment. So that's something that um, I think is quite revolutionary working on currently. And um, um, yeah, I think that's just uh, in short the introduction of what we do and uh, what we've applied that to. Great, thank you, Floor. Um, okay, I I'm pretty impressed by uh, how we did it. So um, we've we've got uh, eight instead of ten minutes left for a discussion, and I don't know in to what extent it matters if we take a little bit more time if the session really uh, shuts off at uh, at quarter to uh, uh, to twelve. But um, yeah, please uh, um, let's see if if I change the screen, then does that show all of us? Maybe if there is any comments or questions then now is the time to to ask them if we can do that through the chat but seeing that we're with a really small group i would say that um we can just um, um click our unmute and um and ask our questions so if there's any comments or ideas or questions from the crowd then please feel free to um uh, to step up to the plate um i think it's all, all right so i'll start, I'll start. great uh, no, super interesting. Thanks for sharing. And I actually live pretty close to this store, so I always walk past it. And I've never been in it because it's been closed recently. Uh, yeah. Hopefully soon. <laughs> um, so, so I have two questions, but I'll start with one. Um, you mentioned that, uh, of course, there's penalties for not, uh, for you know, you have to include the cost of externalities in your price. Do you also mm -hmm. then reward farmers who do, for example, carbon sequestration through regenerative agriculture? And that would mean theoretically that their price is lower, right? Um, is that something that you also take into account and promote to to improve, um, yeah, you know, to make true price more attractive as well? Yeah. So what we what we say is that the, because it's external costs, you cannot have positive external costs. I'd say. Mm -hmm. So the best um, achievable value that you can have on an external cost is zero. Um, but if you have a negative climate impact of producing a certain um, crop and you are compensating for that by, um, for instance, like capturing um, carbon, then you can deduce that from the impact that you have from a certain um, product production process. So if you would look at, if you look at um, true pricing as such, it can help you reduce the true price, so to say. Mm -hmm but there will never be a positive impact on a cost. Um, right. What I mentioned earlier is when we look at um, more an organization basis. So if we look at the whole organization and we look at their full impact, then you can have a positive impact, like a positive net impact when it okay. comes to carbon, if you are carbon positive. Um, but on a, on a production level, like on one product level, we only look at the external cost and on the, at the market price. So then um, you cannot uh, uh, go positive, so to say. And one, maybe one thing that's interesting to mention with that as well is that because we look at this rights-based perspective, we also don't allow um, kind of exchanging positive effects on one part with a, a negative effect on another part. Mm. So that would mean, for instance, if you would have a positive effect on uh, soil quality, that you could kind of sort of lower your your child labor impact with that. Right. Right? So these sense. kinds of trade-offs um, we don't include, uh, but from a, yeah, so you can definitely use it to kind of reduce your cost for a certain product to, um, to zero. The main thing that is still interesting to consider 
in that is then how to attribute it to a certain crop. So if it's not in the particular crop that is a part of that you're calculating the true price of, how much of this positive effect can you then attribute to this one crop? And um, to what extent would it like, so just to make sure that you're not double counting if you're doing yeah. a positive thing in one point and then applying that to all of the other things that you do, um, that would not uh, end up with the, an honest effect either. So that's kind of the, the questions, the follow-up questions that um, would come along with, uh, with doing that. Yeah, thank you. All right. Any other questions? So I, Saskia has another one. So if, if there is no other questions, then Saskia, you can just ask your follow-up question as well. <clears throat> sure. Um, so you mentioned, of course, that especially at the at the shop, right? You you funnel the extra <clears throat> money you get on your cup of coffee to the right organizations. You know that that uh, improve uh, quality of soil or whatnot. How yeah. do how can we make sure as a consumer that companies who pretend to have true cost of price actually do that as well, right? Like, I feel like that could be a barrier to adoption, right? Yeah, completely. No, that's a really good question. And that's something that we've been um, struggling with as well, to an extent. So what's, it's kind of the first, the first barrier that we heard was that people said people will not be willing to pay more. So when we first started to talk about true prices, people were like, there's no demand for this. People will not want to pay more. And kind of what we've been seeing over the past few years is that people do, people do want to pay more and maybe not everybody, but more and more people show that they are willing to pay more when they get the choice. And one interesting example for that is the penny marks in Germany recently uh, also showed the environmental costs of their products. And people actually were interested and that's a price fighter that's like a dutch equivalent of an aldi or a little um like that's a, actually where people go who don't necessarily have too much money to spend generally and they were willing actually to consider paying more so i think those um the fact that we're now talking about how to spend the money when you pay more is in that sense already kind of a step forward from where we were for a long time where people were saying in the market there's there's no market for this um, but it is a re very relevant follow-up question and it is something that also really um, yeah, makes a difference between impacts because if you look at CO2 impacts, for instance, impacts on climate change, um, it doesn't really matter where you take CO2 out of the air because it's in the end a global effect that's, that's happening. Whereas when it comes to soil, um, soil quality, well, if I'm gonna, in my garden here, have very, very fertile soils, someone in Colombia is not gonna be helped with that. So that kind of um, need for it to be local and for it to be um, actually with the people who experience that, um, that issue gives it a bit more of a, makes it a bit more difficult. Um, but we are working on that to see how we can actually get the price back into the, the actual value chain and one interesting thing might also be that we're working on a um, campaign with roses and probably that will be later this year where we're working with a farm in Kenya to get the difference in living uh, wage directly back to the farm. Um, and another part, of course, is that the image that mine has showed, so that had the true price and then the target product, um, when a producer is actually steering on making their true price lower, then you're immediately working locally, of course. So on the one hand, you can talk about, do we need to all start paying it? Yes, but mainly what we will need to start doing is reducing it. And when you're reducing it as a value chain, you're always doing that locally because you're working on your own value chain that you have um, that you have that information on. That's and actually the most important, yeah, if I can add yeah. to that. So that's probably the most important lesson that I've learned in the last one and a half years is that on the one hand, you have uh, more or less a, 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 um, a price that is relatively abstract. So the true price has a couple of elements to it that are abstract. And then always the follow-up question comes, okay, so how are you going to make sure that if I pay more for my banana or for my coffee in this case, how do we make sure that that money that is being paid for a specific subject is really being used also to, to, to bring down that, that specific cost? Um, and I think the conclusion for now is that if you can show, and, and for that you need direct and traceable uh, products and you need direct relations with the producers. So for 
70 or 80 percent of the coffee that is very difficult right now but for the ones the companies that are working directly with farms and working directly with producers they can show that the producer is uh, together with them or uh, on, on his on his own is doing a specific investment to bring down these hidden costs and that investment has a, has, a, has a real price tag to it and you can explain to your customer if we pay like uh let's say two thousand euros to bring down the uh, uh the the water pollution to a an absolute minimum then you can use that two thousand euros investment as a price component on on, on a product level and uh, bringing down the, this true this true cost component so it's always about the real investment in our opinion compared to the to the um, uh, to the true cost um, or true price component and that provides companies with um, um, uh, with the option to start working because else it's, it will it will it will keep being very difficult so without without that being there it's perfect that true price has this this option in the store to uh, to put put money in in these two subjects through a third party if companies are able to show that they can do it themselves, that of course is is uh, is a in, in our opinion, looking from the from the uh, company network perspective, has our preference. Yes? So we see that from these 25 companies, all of them are willing to explain to their customers why the coffee needs to be a bit more expensive. So they are able to bring that money to their producers to invest in bringing down the negative impacts. So I would say it's a combination for now, and hopefully in the end, uh, all companies will be able to show how they're using their own true price to bring down the negative impacts to a, a bare minimum. Um, from um, Fairtrade's perspective, I would like to say that, so along the way we, we got in contact with Fairtrade and um, um, we saw that Fairtrade was working on the fair uh, living income reference price in the, exactly the three countries that we were uh, also aiming at. So uh, Colombia, Peru, and hopefully in the future Uganda. Um, so that brought us to the point where we more or less, I'm looking at the floor also because she was, uh, um, um, she was active in that part, but we um, synchronized our methods in a way that um, if, if farmers are working already with a true price methodology, they can use their outcomes of that calculation and, in, um, and implement those directly into the true cost tooling so that they do not have to work, do the work twice. And in the end, I think that's an a small example of how we should together work on ways to make sure that there are as little different standards or as little different uh, methodologies as possible in the marketplace. And that's also what Flora referred to earlier, that uh, that's one of the main goals for true prices to make sure that, um, that the standardization takes place. Because in the end, all these companies, they really want to start working with this, but then if they get stuck in, in all the options that are there to work on, on, on true pricing, true cost accounting, true value, whatnot, then, um, then it will make life a lot more difficult. So I think the example with uh, fair trade, we're actually pretty happy with that. And, um, uh, and also in the end, you hope to show that fair trade products are, as show a, a smaller uh, um, living income gap than, than other types of products. And of course, companies in our network do that sometimes with fair trade coffee, but in a lot of cases also with um, not uh, with non uh, um, certified coffees, but uh, well, we're pretty happy with that. Any other questions? Margaret, um, maybe any comments from you? Uh, Sorry. I had a, I had a question. Um, was there something that um, like struck you when designing this this tool, like some information after you you gathered some information maybe from the coffee sector, from the rose sector? What 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 was something that struck stuck out from that like um, during your uh, measurements? Oh, a couple of things stood out. Um, the most important one was that we thought we would be. Um, um, putting a, a burden on farmers so that we really need to, we, of course, you always need to be, uh, need to be uh, polite and, and see if, if, if you're doing something that these, these uh, uh, um, part, partners at the other end of the value chain are actually uh, interested in. But we were very careful with that. And in the end, uh, the reality showed that practically all of them were really, really very happy to put time and effort in the calculations and also were really enthusiastic about the lessons they took from 
um, the results. We do not for now have um, enough data collected to take to make sort of a, a, uh, a common uh, claim about the, the true cost of coffee in Colombia because it's really scattered and um, um, uh, we need to work on, uh, on the, the, um, the, the cleanness of the, of, the, of the data, so to speak. But uh, the other thing that stood out is that in a lot of cases, the company or the, the producers themselves, they do not uh, for now have a clear um, uh, view of their normal cost of production. So we came to them, said, okay, we're going to calculate your hidden cost of production. And then they said, well, that's nice, but we also would really like to know what is, what is our normal cost of production. So really economic cost of production. And so that was an insight that brought us also to in, include in the second version of the tool, an option to, to, to uh, bring together all these cost elements and get, get, give a clear uh, view of the total cost of production for farmers, which really helps them to uh, look at their own um, uh, operations. And um, so that was an, an extra benefit that we didn't foresee because with our dumb uh, Western view, we thought in a lot of cases, farmers would have that uh, in place and we would add something to that. But uh, that was a second um, epiphany or second insight that we, uh, we had along the way. <clears throat> um, when it comes to, um, to the impacts, what you see is that living income in, in, I would say in Colombia, the things that we've seen so far is that the impacts on planet are there, but the living income component in most cases is uh, the most striking. So this under, under earning on coffee is the bottleneck issue. Um, and you cannot solve that um, just by paying more. You need to make the coffee production uh, more sustainable in all different, uh, um, uh, in all different fields. So um, by, by just paying more um, without asking something in return, that, that is of course a start, but also really support farmers to make their business model and their farming model into something that will be there in 10 years. So we need to support them to move away from, from um, um, uh, uh, chemical fertilizer uh, um, uh, and, 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 and monoculture, because that in the end is something that is already really taking away uh, aerial uh, uh, coffee production area in, in, in countries around the world. So really need to find an answer to that, along with tackling this living income uh, component as soon as possible. Um, Yesterday I spoke to a relatively big uh, Dutch coffee company. Uh, I won't name the name because we need to make sure that they put their money where their mouth is. But they indicated that they aim to put on their website somewhere along this year that they are intending to um, take out all coffee in their assortment where they uh, uh, do not have a do not know where the coffee comes from. So that's first of all direct uh, uh, traceability, and then also they in, will start indicating that for all that coffee, they will take steps to move towards a living income for the producers. So this is the, there is a lot of movement in the market. We also see that uh, the government in the Netherlands is taking steps to include uh, this component, uh, this true price, or at least uh, a, a truer price into their, um, into their procurement um, 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 texts. So we see a lot of movement and we are very happy that we can work closely together with, um, with uh, organizations such as True Price and uh, Fair Trade International to make sure that um, we nudge as many people as possible to move into the right direction. But we believe coffee is an interesting one because it's a very emotional product. People love their cup of, a cup of coffee in the morning and uh, everybody has ideas about how they want, want their coffee. Um, and we have ideas about how we want the coffee to be produced and brought to the market. So. It's a good adventure. Yeah, thanks. Great, and I know what you said about the, the multinational. Yeah, I could, uh, building on uh, what you already said, elaborate a bit on living income and uh, what we are collecting at the moment. So, um, like you already know, uh, of course, first we start with establishing the benchmark, but then uh, we also need to calculate uh, the different parameters. So, productivity, uh, levels, cost of production, but also viable farm size. So how large is the farm versus uh, full-time equivalent uh, working there, uh, income diversification levels, etc. So, and that's what you just mentioned. That's what we're all collecting uh, from those farm record tools. Um, 
and uh, validating the secondary data sources, and then we can establish the optimal parameters on productivity, viable farm size, et cetera, but also the living income reference price. So the price that's needed when those parameters are on an optimal level uh, for a farmer to be able to earn a living income. Um, and from there, you can start really working towards it in, uh, in, in projects, uh, etc. So uh, I think I'm really happy that we cooperate now there at the moment in, in multiple countries. So thank you. And if you have any questions on that, uh, please let me know. Yeah, I have a question. So um, um, for, for Colombia, I know that uh, your study is, is, is relatively uh, advanced. Um, uh, do you, are you are you already looking at uh, a point in time where these reference prices will be brought, um, uh, will be communicated uh, broadly? And uh, uh, how can we make sure that we uh, we create a thunderclap there and, and make sure that we uh, make as much noise as possible? Because I think uh, that is a very interesting, uh, um, uh, could be a very interesting moment. Yeah, good one. So we are, for Colombia, we're now uh, validating all the data. Um, and if, COVID doesn't really, um, how do you call um, uh, Spoil things. In our planning. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Then uh, we're looking at um, uh, quarter one, uh, where we would be able to establish a living income reference price. So we'll keep those contacts with you once yeah. we know more. And I was, uh, also, I was also intrigued by the, the fact that probably in the end, it will show that even the fair trade price does not cover that, right? So that will also be... Uh, a, a thing that you will probably be commented on. Is it something that you really want to put out there in the in the press or in the media, or is it something that you will bring a bit more uh, safely or, or um, with smaller steps, for instance? Yeah. You, you mean the fair trade minimum price? Exactly, yeah, that's yeah. the word for so it, yeah. The minimum price, but that's meant to cover the costs of sustainable production. Um, yeah. But it's not uh, meant to cover the living income price. So like cocoa, we want to work towards living income reference price, of course. So we started with a 20% increase last year to work towards uh, a gradually living income reference price. Um, but the living income reference price, uh, the main objective is to set a dot on the horizon so we know where, uh, as an industry, we have to work towards. Yeah, all right. Okay, yeah. and, and how that 20% in cocoa, how did that uh, did, did that influence the, the demand for, for fair trade coffee or fair trade cocoa in that case? Yeah, yeah. so that's where we are also struggling as a system. So uh, once we uh, raised that price, uh, we lost uh, some sales, like yeah. 10%. Um, and that's um, why we also have to balance uh, and step by step increase uh, the, the minimum price uh, yeah. to the income price, because if you do it all at once, yeah. Lose the impact we have now for the fair trade system. Yeah. So a lot yeah. of work for Susanna on this side of the value chain to get, uh, exactly. get all the companies uh, yeah. aligned to uh, to start putting the money where their mouth is. Yeah, and along uh, with all you. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> yeah. it's a great. I think it's a really good um, uh, example of how we should um, all work uh, towards that point. And I'm really. Looking forward to finding out what that reference price for Colombia uh, is when it finally comes out and uh, see if we can um, uh, use it as good as possible to, uh, to, to use it in the market. Yeah, great. And great. Thank you. Well, I think um, we already a uh, quarter of an hour. Um, um, we're not being kicked out yet. So uh, uh, if, if there is any more questions, maybe one or two last questions or comments are, uh, are possible or otherwise we can... Um, Put an end to this meeting, but uh, I would love to hear anything more if there is more comments. You can also definitely get in touch over email or in another way if there's any. I think we've already lost a few people who've had to go to the next session. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so um, you're right. Um, okay, well, let's then um, share the slides with everybody who was on uh, on the on the session, and uh, in the slides, links to your um, documents. They work, right, uh, Flora? Yeah. Yeah, all right, okay. Well, thanks a lot then, Julia, Margaret, and- uh, Thank you, thank you. <laughs> all right, thank you. If there's any questions, you know where to, uh, where to find us. Yes. All right, ciao. Thank you.